All right, so topic two today, we're not getting into anything too heavy this week. Um, we're gonna be talking about what hydrology is, we're gonna talk about world, Alberta water resources, and uh, I'll kind of get into uh, some of these things. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, I think I mentioned last day that we have no official textbook for this course, uh, but I will have links and references where I'm getting my information. And uh, sometimes I'm gonna point out things that, uh, that you are going to need to, uh, to read. Um, for example, one document that I posted on Moodle is this document here, which is called Facts About Water in Alberta. Uh, it's about 10 years old, but it's actually a really good document that talks about Alberta's water resources. So for test one, I haven't set the date yet for test one. Um, I think what I'll do is announce that on Wednesday, depending on how far we get. Uh, but for test one, you should read over sections one to three. Some of this is going to be covered in lecture. There may be a few things I'm going to pull out of there um, for the test. So make sure you do read that. That's a required reading. Um, I'm not always going to show this thing unless there is something that I do feel is, is essential for, uh, for reading. But if you are looking for more information on these things, go to this page on each of the sets of lecture notes. And, and there are some... Uh, some resources there for you. Some of them are YouTube links, some of them are documents from the government, um, all sorts of different things. So there is Earth. And um, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the Goldilocks principle, um, but the Goldilocks is that story about the three bears and the porridge is either too hot or too cold or just right. And uh, so this is something that uh, astrologists talk about in terms of Earth is just right in terms of uh, the right temperatures for water. If you think about Venus, it's too close to the sun. There's water there, but it's all in the form of vapor. If we go a little further away from the sun, uh, we have Mars, water there is all ice, whereas the Earth is just right, um, where we have water in actually all three forms. In fact, uh, um, I was looking this up, and apparently if planet Earth was just 5% closer or further from the sun, uh, then we would not be in that Goldilocks zone. Uh, things would not be as nice as we would like it to be. And why do we care about water being liquid? Because of course, water is important for life. And uh, well, I'm assuming you all like to be alive and uh, you probably have a little bit of interest in biology since you're an environmental program. And so, um, yeah, water, water is super important for life. And uh, it's, it's a really, it's really an amazing resource that we have. So let's talk about how much water is on the planet. Uh, I found this little graphic here put together by the United States government showing all of the water on the planet uh, compared to the size of the planet. So we take a look at that, the diameter is about 1400 kilometers. To give you an idea how big that is, uh, Alberta from north to south, uh, if you go from the top of Alberta to the uh, south of Alberta, it's about 1,200 kilometers. So you've got a sphere about that big. Um, very large volume, that's, what is that, 1.4 billion cubic kilometers. Uh, that's a big number. Uh, so this little guy here is the fresh water from the planet. In fact, uh, it's actually a little bit less than 3%. I think it's closer to 2.5% if I remember correctly. Have to look that one up. I have a, a table I'll actually show you in a minute here. And uh, unfortunately, with fresh water, a lot of it is locked up. It's not accessible. It's either in the ground or it's in ice caps or glaciers. We can't get all of that. And that's actually with that teeny tiny little drop uh, that's left over there. And uh, that's uh, mostly rivers and lakes and represents 0.01% of the water on the planet. So <laughs> not much. Here's some actual numbers, um, estimates by, I don't know, I think this is also the United States government. And uh, you can see that most of the water on our planet is found in the ocean. So probably no surprise there, 96, 97%. And the next biggest chunk is actually ice caps followed by groundwater. So um, what we care about, of course, is the fresh water. And that's what I have here uh, outlined in, in the yellow. And uh, that's, uh, like I said, about, about somewhere around 2.5%. Um, <laughs> so it's not a lot of water available to humans. 
This is just some charts kind of showing the same type of information. There's the total water. Most of it is oceans. And most of the fresh water is that little wedge at the top, of which most of that is glaciers. And groundwater is a little bit of surface water. And that surface water, we can break that down into different components. And that is what it is available to humans. Um, so some definitions for you. Um, probably not going to use these definitions a lot, but you may hear them in other classes when you uh, talk about uh, lakes and things like that. But when we talk about freshwater ecosystems, uh, often they're broken into two categories, Atlantic or Lotic. So Atlantic system has still water. So usually what we mean by there are lakes or ponds or reservoirs or something like that, um, sometimes uh, swamps, right? Uh, a Lotic system is flowing, so rivers and streams. So if you see those terms, uh, I'm not, those, I will not ask you those terms on a test, by the way. Um, they're just some definitions. Like I said, you may see them in your travels, in some of your other classes and whatnot. Uh, the reason why these things are, are important is because they are major water sources for humans, right? So lakes, reservoirs, rivers, and then the other one that is doesn't fall under Atlantic or Lotic is, of course, groundwater, which is also a major, major source of water for humans. And we're going to talk about groundwater uh, probably today. All right, one more graph. I like graphs and stats. So you'll probably see a lot in this course. You can see 99% of the water on the planet is unusable. And 99% of that usable water is groundwater. That leaves about 1% for lakes and rivers. So depending on where you are on the planet, this, uh, this may be important or not important information. And we're going to talk about Alberta water. Not sure if we're going to quite get to Alberta water today, but you'll see that uh, depending on where you are in Alberta, um, there's different scenarios available to you. So I just want to talk a little bit about water scarcity. Um, depending on where you are from, I know some of you were not born in Canada. Um, this is a bigger issue or a lesser of an issue. Canada is actually a very water rich country. We have lakes and rivers basically everywhere. And uh, most places in Canada are not concerned about running out of water, but other parts of the world are. And the term for this is called water scarcity. Basically means uh, you may not have enough water for some sort of use. It could be basic uses such as living uh, or uses such as agriculture or, or uh, you know, sustenance or, or whatnot. Um, so water is everywhere. Why is there scarcity? Um, probably the obvious thing is much of it is salt. Um, but um, you know, a lot of water is not, it's just not suitable for what uh, we're looking at, right? Um, sometimes water scarcity is due to economic reasons. Um, just think about it, you know, in your house, if you did not have a tap, where would you get the water, right? You would probably have to pay a company or have a, let's say a town well or something like that. And it's not as easy as you might think. We're just living in a very convenient industrialized society where this is something we don't have to think about a lot, but other parts of the world you do, you have to think about where you're gonna get your water from. Um, and uh, pretty much 50% of the, of the human population is in this category. Uh, where they may have uh, economic difficulties for getting the basics of life, such as water. Something else we're going to talk about a little bit here and there over the semester is climate change. And um, one thing about climate change, of course, is it's affecting uh, uh, you know, average temperatures and, and, and uh, all sorts of other places. And uh, this is something that may uh, affect uh, water quality and water availability worldwide. You can see this little graphic from Natural Resources Canada, which is talking about it's going to vary things like glacier melt and um, it'll have effects on agriculture and forest fires and things like this, that like that. Uh, this past year for agriculture was bad. I don't know if anybody went anywhere this past summer. Uh, I went to Ontario and um, just trying to remember when I went. Was it July, August? I can't even remember when I went now. Maybe it was late July. Um, when I was driving across, the crops weren't looking as healthy as usual. Uh, and on my way back, they were brown. Um, I've never seen that before. It was very, very bad. Uh, if you're interested in this geopolitical stuff, I encourage you to check out this link here. 
Uh, you can see they provided this map and uh, we talk about water scarcity and and uh, geopolitical reasons why uh, you know there's issues with water in various places. You can imagine some parts of the world uh, there's only so much water and there's a lot of people and maybe you have to share a lake or a river or a source of water with another country, another state, those kind of things. You can see Canada is mostly in the green zone. Like I said, we are very, very fortunate in Canada. Um, I'm not gonna worry about this particular slide there, except for the stat here at the bottom. It says a person in Canada having a five minute shower uses more water than the average person in a developing country slum for an entire day. Um, kind of mind blowing, right? Think about not having enough water. Uh, I think I kind of touched on some of these things already. Uh, threats to water supply, pollution, population expansion, climate change, things like that. So most of that's pretty obvious stuff. So back to Canada, um, this is kind of uh, related to that other map rather than water stability. This just has to do with fresh water availability. And Canada apparently has about 20% of the world's fresh water. We do not have 20% of the people. Uh, that is a lot of, uh, a lot of water. Um, if you kind of zoom in, on water availability in Canada, you can see that uh, actually Alberta is one area in Canada that has some, um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna quite call it water scarcity, but Southern Alberta is a lot drier than many parts in Canada. And something you may or may not know about um, Alberta is Alberta has a lot of farmland. Um, and that southern Alberta part, we're going to talk about that, that southern Alberta part actually has something like 60% of uh, Canada's irrigated cropland. I know, I mean, it's huge. Most people think of all the farming that's going on in all the prairie provinces, meaning Saskatchewan and Manitoba, but southern Alberta really is a prairie province. And uh, we have tons and tons of farming going on and tons and tons of uh, uh, um, irrigation going on. And so this is a concern. This is something that uh, uh, people down there are worried about in terms of, you know, whether they're going to have uh, fresh water to um, plant all those crops. So this is, uh, I really like this, uh, this graph here, or this, um, this image of Canada, and it's trying to show you uh, a little bit of a map of all the, uh, the major river and lake systems. Uh, I, I like things like that. It's pretty cool. Um, but you can see it says here, there's about, I guess, 1.1 million square kilometers in Canada of water, uh, that is covered by water, um, about 11, 12%. Um, it's huge. Canada is, is really an interesting place to be. So moving on, the question is, where does the water come from? Um, water is finite. Uh, meaning that our planet doesn't make more of it. Uh, it doesn't arrive from outer space or anything like that. So where does it come from? It is, it is a renewable resource. And uh, so you, you probably know about the water cycle. Um, I don't know when we learn about the water cycle. Um, I kind of remember learning about it probably in grade seven or something like that. <laughs> um, so sometimes the water cycle is called the hydrologic cycle, uh, hydrology. It's a study of movement in water. And so first question is, and usually I ask people in class, do you remember what are the six processes of the water cycle? Anyone name two or three of them? Evaporation, that's one. Precipitation. Precipitation, here we go, there's two. Runoff. Runoff, there we go. Those are the ones, yeah. Figured you guys knew it. Um, those are basically the six processes. Sometimes people will break them down into, uh, in, into uh, kind of subcategories and things like that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of them, but there they are. There's one, evaporation. Evaporation, condensation is in the uh, sky. Precipitation is when the water is running down. There's the surface runoff infiltration, 
and also uh, transpiration. So uh, like I said, I want to talk a little bit about each of these kind of just defining a few things. And um, we'll talk a little bit about groundwater as well. So evaporation, um, that's where water is basically going from uh, liquid to gas form. Um, this is a big part of um, what drives a water cycle. And uh, most of this is, is basically solar power, right? Think about it, you've got the sun is warming up the earth and this is causing uh, the liquid water to change from the gas to vapor form. So this is how it's getting back into the atmosphere and really driving, driving the water cycle. Uh, it says here, where does large scale evaporation occur? And of course, where is most of the water on the earth? And that would be the oceans. Because there's so much water there. So condensation, uh, this is where um, the, the water vapor is starting to, I guess you could say, aggregate together and starting to form uh, liquid. And uh, so this is basically the formation of, of clouds, right? And so this is where we start to see the clouds. And, and uh, th there's a lot I actually don't really understand about the process of condensation myself. Um, my understanding is that there's a lot of uh, dust and bacterial particles that actually help with this process. Um, but not something I can really tell you I know very much about. There's a little image showing condensation. You can see there's, there's particulates there. Like I said, the vapor kind of congregates around the uh, particulates and starts to form, um, you know, well, sometimes solid, sometimes liquid uh, uh, particles. And, and then what we see are the clouds, right? So there's kind of a, like I said, nice little graphic on that. So precipitation is um, when it gets heavy enough and it falls down. And uh, there are many types of precipitation. Uh, and I don't really care too much about the classifications of the different types of precipitation. Um, you know, we're not the weather channel here, but uh, if you're interested, there's, there's a few of them. Some people would consider uh, fog a type of precipitation. Um, I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but uh, we're not really sure. Okay, so a um, couple of things here about precipitation. Let's see, I have a, um, a word for you, right? So it says here, as air rises, it cools adiabatically. So there's that word, adiabatically. So if you don't know what that word means, it, it means that um, as, uh, as, uh, as, as water vapor um, increases in elevation, it expands, and that actually causes it to cool which helps with the condensation process. Um, like I said, the details aren't really too important here, but mostly just know what precipitation is. Another thing I wanted to um, show you here is uh, a size, right? So we're gonna be working a lot with the metric system in this class. And uh, so there is a unit right there. So that is a micrometer. So you might know what a millimeter is, so millimeter is basically one one thousandth of a, of a meter. So it's 10 to the minus uh, three meters, right? A micrometer, micrometer is one one millionth of a meter. So this is pretty small. Uh, to give you an idea, a, a hundred micrometers, so hundred micrometers, is about the width of human hair. And that's about the resolution of the human eye, by the way. So anything skinnier than that, uh, our eyes cannot see it. So the droplets form, they get bigger. As they fall down, they usually gain mass and then you're gonna get raindrops that are a lot more visible to the, uh, to the eye and, and, and that are measure, measurable. But, it's about that one to 100 micrometers where they actually start to uh, be affected by gravity. Ah, and there's my definition. I didn't realize I had it on the slide. So micrometer or micron is another way we say it, 10 to the minus six meters. Uh, surface runoff is basically where it's uh, flowing over the land. Um, there's a lot to say about surface runoff um, when we're talking about things like soils, and erosion, 
things like that, that I'm sure you'll cover in other classes. Um, something that is uh, thought about a lot if you are a city planner is of course surface runoff or storm runoff. If you think about what's going on in a city, um, we have paved parking lots, we have sidewalks, all those kind of things. So the water does not get absorbed in the same way around cities as it does uh, out in nature. Plus we are trying to avoid having uh, water pooling in certain places. We'd rather not have a flooded house or a driveway or a street or anything like that. So a lot of this is kind of thought about in terms of stormwater. And we are gonna talk about stormwater kind of later on somewhere maybe three quarters of the way through the course. So we'll kind of come back to some of these concepts uh, later on in the course. Totally related to uh, runoff is infiltration. Infiltration is where the water is starting to permeate uh, into the soil and between rocks and things like that. And we'll talk about uh, uh, groundwater here in a minute. And then number six is transpiration. And transpiration is kind of like plants sweating. Um, the plants will take up water through their roots and the water goes through the tissues, ends up in the leaves, and a certain amount of water is actually lost to the atmosphere. Sometimes we call this evapotranspiration uh, because it is evaporating from the leaves. So this is about 10% of the moisture in an atmosphere, by the way. Uh, so this is not something that is trivial. This is actually quite significant. And if you go to places like rainforests, um, this is actually a much higher percentage. And this is why they have that annual, or sorry, daily kind of uh, raining cycle because so much water is, is uh, sucked out by these plants, gets in the atmosphere and then re-rains uh, on a daily basis. So um, very, very important um, ecologically and, and to the planet because there's a lot of plants on the planet. So something else to think about the, um, about the water cycle is that humans are constantly intervening, right? Uh, and uh, I think it's represented really well by this particular image here, right? You can see we've got, uh, you've got some rain, some uh, evaporation there, you've got the sun, you've got the surface runoff, but you also have the humans embedded in there where we are taking the water, we're using it um, for our uses. Some of those uses put it directly back in the environment. Um, sometimes we treat it first by before putting it back in the environment. And so, you know, this is something we are going to be talking about kind of all semester. Uh, water usage is kind of the second half of the course where we're really going to get into the nitty gritties on, on um, a lot of these processes. And um, so just something to think about. Uh, you can see I've got this um, kind of, uh, call it the urban water cycle, right? Where the water is taken from the environment, usually from the things that I mentioned, lakes and rivers, reservoirs, et cetera. Uh, we withdraw it. Usually what we do is treat it first and then we drink it or use it for other things, um, all sorts of uses. And like I said, we'll talk about those things uh, later on. And uh, uh, usually before we discharge it back in the environment, we're going to treat it at a wastewater treatment plant and then it's put back, put back into the river or wherever uh, it's going. So much more on this kind of thing, like I said, uh, throughout the semester. Um, obviously, human activities can have massive effects on water. Uh, something, like I said, kind of going to be a theme all semester, talking about water quality and quantity and things like that. And so it's important that we do manage our water appropriately. And um, that's one of the things we'll talk about. We'll talk a little bit about the oil sands um, uh, uses. Uh, like I said, a lot of the water use and things like that is going to be sort of the second half of the course. So we'll come back to that a little bit later on. Now you can see this image here is depicting kind of a, a light usage on the left and a heavier usage on the right. And you can see that uh, um, if our, we don't manage our water property, we're looking at a loss of biodiversity, degraded soils, um, all sorts of things like that, pollution um, and, and whatnot. So you're probably wondering a little bit about what humans actually use water for. I know the obvious ones where, you know, you think about uh, drinking and and cooking and maybe laundry and, and, uh, and those kind of things. But here's some numbers for you. Um, these are the most recent I could find. I couldn't find anything newer than 2013 from Stats Canada. I imagine they don't collect this data very often, maybe once every 10 years. I imagine the numbers are not much um, different, right? So this here's the total. 
So this is 37, 37,892 um, cubic meters. And uh, the number one usage by far is right here. So you can see that this is 25 cubic meters. This is for electric power generation. Um, so basically power plants so that we can have electricity. This is the number one use by a huge, huge amount. Uh, number two is manufacturing. And uh, that's kind of a catch all, which includes all sorts of things um, across the country. Uh, does not include the oil uh, industry. You can see they're kind of in their own category with mining right here. And then households are number three. So household usage is, is us uh, flushing our toilets, having our showers, cooking, eating, drinking, laundry, those kind of things. Uh, agriculture is on there, of course, is also a big one. And, uh, and these numbers uh, change a little bit here and there, depending on what province you're in and things like that. So some of these things we will talk about. Here's Alberta, by the way. Um, Alberta, number one is agriculture. Uh, this is the kind of thing that just shocks people. You know, when I ask them what they think, who uses the most water in Alberta, um, almost everyone I talk to says, oh, it's got to be the oil industry. Oil industry is right here. So it turns out irrigation is number one. Uh, cooling, this is mostly electrical power. Uh, so, which is number one in Canada, right? Hydroelectric power. Um, and right here is, um, is households, basically, right? So if you take a look at that, um, the oil industry is actually comes in at number four, maybe number five. I'm not sure which is commercial it is higher. Uh, so kind of a little shock to people, right? Um, most people seem to think the oil industry is using a huge amount, uh, of which they are using a huge amount. But if you look at compared to what else is going on in Alberta, um, the uh, uh, agriculture industry in Alberta is massive. I know everyone thinks so much about oil living in Fort McMurray, but if you look at all of Alberta, agriculture really is king. Uh, here's just another uh, kind of graph, um, I guess, showing what's going on in Canada uh, from those 2013 numbers. I should show this next, just a pie graph. Sometimes people like different representations and there's a pie graph for you with electrical power being number one by far. So back to hydrology uh, and just want to kind of, like I said today, I'm kind of just overviewing a few things and defining a bunch of things. And hydrology really is uh, the movement of water uh, in the environment and on land and, and those kind of things. So there's a lot of ways we could talk about hydrology. And um, one way that we can talk about hydrology is of course, uh, the study of lakes, which is limnology. So another definition for you. Um, Technically, limnology is, is inland water, so it could include uh, fresh water or salt water. But usually when people say limnology, um, they usually mean uh, lakes and rivers and streams and things like that. But it can include, um, can include groundwater as well. So if you take a look at that definition. Um, I guess I defined these already for you. Uh, lentic versus lotic. Lentic, of course, is still water and lotic is flowing. I don't really know a good way to remember that. but. I will tell you, I won't ask you that on a test. I might use a word by accident, but I won't directly ask you to define the difference between these two. It's not really too important to, um, to this course. Uh, lakes, of course, are huge, important uh, systems in Alberta. Um, and I uh, just want to talk a little bit about lakes for a minute. Uh, they're important for ecological systems and also sources of water uh, all over the province in many places. Um, when we talk about lakes, uh, sometimes people talk about different parameters, such as uh, um, the depth, the volume, uh, the water flow in and out, uh, those kind of things. We're going to talk a little bit about physical parameters, such as uh, pH and turbidity and things like that over the next couple of weeks. And of course, all these are uh, important for the organisms living in, in, the, uh, in the system. Um, Again, something I'm not going to kind of get into a whole bunch. This sort of covers uh, some of the things that Neil would be talking about in terms of formation of lakes and geology and things like that. Not really something I'm an expert on, um, but I find it interesting. Uh, here's Abraham Lake. I don't know if anyone has been to Abraham Lake in Alberta. Um, 
pretty nice place. It's kind of, um, just trying to think what that place is called. It's west of Rocky Mountain House. So kind of uh, Rocky Mountain House is kind of west of Red Deer and you, you just keep going west and, until you're almost in the mountains and you hit this big, big, long, crazy blue lake called Abraham Lake. And this one actually was, is, is, a, uh, is a human made reservoir. At least that's the origin of it anyway. And so that has a lot of effects on its, on its biology and things like that. Um, there's lots that could be said about these things, like I said, in terms of the geology and things like that. I'm not really going to get into those kind of details. Not so important for this course. Um, some more definitions for you in terms of what is going on. I'm, I'm not going not gonna to dwell on this. I'm just going to move on from that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about groundwater. And uh, this is something that um, is covered a lot more in, in other classes as well. But it's worth talking about for a few minutes just to make sure you guys know all the kind of um, basics and definitions around um, groundwater. Uh, here's a nice picture showing some precipitation. You've got some infiltration, and water is is getting into the, uh, the ground. And uh, usually, what happens is is there's an upper surface layer that is unsaturated, meaning that it has water, but there's also air available uh, for more water. And uh, and usually there's a point where the saturated zone begins. And the saturated zone is, of course, called the water table. And you can see that's marked by this, by this dotted line. And then that body of water, where the water is stored, is called the aquifer. And so all three of those words are kind of uh, interrelated. Groundwater is any water in the ground. The aquifer is the body or the region or the section where the water is actually found. And the water table, like I said, is the uh, is a defined zone where the saturated part begins. Uh, the water table can change. If you've got precipitation, you've got the water is being drawn from the aquifer. Um, you have uh, a dry spell, it dries up, um, you know, those kind of things. So the water table can, can change, of course. Um, in terms of aquifers, uh, basically any time there's space in there, right? So if you think about, um, where space is going to be, it's going to be found between pieces of gravel and cracks and fractured rock and those kind of things. And here's kind of a list of common um, uh, media that, that would form a lot of, uh, a lot of aquifers. And uh, anyway, I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, some of these things you will talk about in other courses like soils and whatnot in terms of, uh, you know, what is good for retaining water and whatnot. Uh, one other thing about aquifers is sometimes um, aquifers can, uh, can be confined or unconfined. Um, so an aquifer here, you can see this, this top one here, this unconfined aquifer is, uh, is uh, basically it's accessible to the surface is what you're looking at. A confined aquifer, sometimes there's something in there, a layer uh, that could be clay or rock or, or something that is... Uh, it's trapping the water below. And, and sometimes people access these confined aquifers by drilling wells and things like that. Um, but anyway, just a, another uh, definition thing there for you. So um, groundwater is important, um, depending on who you are uh, and, and what you're doing. And uh, if you're looking at, uh, li if you're living in a city in Alberta, uh, groundwater is probably not something you're dealing with that often, unless you're an environmental scientist, of course. Um, most cities in Alberta are getting uh, water from lakes or rivers. Um, but if you're a rural Alberta, and I have a number here somewhere, um, here it is, 90%. So 90% of rural Alberta, so that, that involves about maybe 3% uh, of Albertans um, are using water wells as their source of water for their home or farms or whatever. Uh, so that's somewhere around maybe half a million wells or something like that. Uh, and uh, I don't know if anybody here has had a well. My parents, uh, when they grew up, we had a well in our home and um, it was a big hole. And at the bottom, there was a pump. The pump had uh, kind of a filter on the end, uh, you know, in case any clay or dirt or whatever got into it. Um, there are many designs, but the whole idea is that the, the hole is, is deep enough that is going to be into the aquifer, right? So um, depending on where you are, sometimes you have to dig pretty deep. Uh, my parents' well wasn't that deep. Um, I would say, I'm just trying to think, remember looking down it, it probably was only two or three meters deep. Uh, 
now that I think about it. But I remember uh, one of our neighbors about maybe one, four houses down, were digging a well and uh, not really much change in elevation. And they had to go really deep. I remember I was there that day and they brought the uh, well drilling machine and they had to put on the longer bits and then they had to put on a longer bit. And I bet you it went down at least uh, 15, 20 meters before they really got into the aquifer. So I thought that was interesting. I don't really know what is going on in terms of the, uh, the land structure there, but kind of interesting. So let me see where we are with time. Okay, so I was not sure how far we would get today. I've done a little bit of uh, kind of restructuring with this course. So the lecture material is not in the same order that I'm usually um, going through in the course, um, but we'll uh, probably not quite cover all of this topic today. Um, but when I do talk a little bit about Alberta's water resources and a little bit about uh, what's going on locally as well. So a lot of this stuff is from that document that I told you to read topic uh, sections one to three, that government document I have posted on Moodle. And like I said, it is going to be in, um, in test one and I will uh, announce the details of test one on, um, on, uh, on this coming Wednesday. So let's talk about Alberta. So Alberta uh, apparently has 2.2% of Canada's fresh water. And uh, Alberta is kind of a weird province because the 80% uh, the, um, of the water is found in the north. So we're considered Northern Alberta. By, by Northern Alberta, usually people mean anything north of Edmonton. So that would include Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, Boyle, Grassland, and everything that's much further north, uh, Fort Chippewan and things like that. Um, but 80% of the population is in Southern Alberta. So, you know, this is, this is a problem, at least for people in Southern Alberta who need, uh, who need all that water. Uh, let's break it down, look in a little bit more details, but I just want to quickly point out a couple of things in this map here, a couple of things that we are going to talk about. The map does not show Fort McMurray. Um, just trying to think where Fort McMurray is. There's the Clearwater River. And I think, so Fort McMurray is along the Clearwater River where the clear, okay, so we've got to be right here somewhere, right? That's where the Clearwater meets the Athabasca. So that's probably where Fort McMurray is, if I got that correct. Um, here's the Athabasca River, okay? The Athabasca River starts here in the Rockies and flows kind of in that direction. Eventually the, the Athabasca River flows into Lake Athabasca. So Lake Athabasca is the largest lake in Alberta although half of it is in Saskatchewan. And then eventually this is going to flow out north uh, into Northwest Territories. And uh, that's kind of some of the main things I wanted to point out for now. We'll see some of these things on some of the other maps I'm going to mention. Uh, so here's some numbers for you in terms of how much water is falling on Alberta. And uh, so apparently 336 billion cubic meters. and um, how much is flowing in and, and uh, surface runoff and things like that. Um, I'm not sure how it all balances out, um, but kind of an interesting little graphic going over some of those numbers. Um, I guess I kind of said this already, uh, that we have uh, a lot of water in Alberta's north, uh, many rivers and many lakes, um, many swamps and wetlands. Uh, Northern Alberta is just full of them. Um, and you can see that whenever you drive on the highway, there's swamps and rivers, it seems like pretty much everywhere. Not as many large lakes like some of the other provinces, um, but uh, lots of small little lakes everywhere. And, and much of it, um, despite all the news, a, a lot of northern Alberta is actually not developed. The oil sands obviously is a very large, um, a very large chunk of the development in northern Alberta. And like I said, we'll touch a little bit more on that uh, later on. Uh, southern Alberta, um, not a lot of lakes, uh, lower volume rivers, and so the people in Southern Alberta are a little bit more reliant on uh, irrigation and groundwater more than, than Northern Alberta. There's another uh, little graph here just showing the, the geography of, of uh, Northern Canada. And uh, so just for anybody who's interested in geography, we've got Canadian Shield over here. We have the boreal forest here, and of course, Fort McMurray is in the boreal forest. 
uh, southern Alberta, much of that is prairie and, and uh, badlands and things like that. So here's another graphic. Um, I love graphics. I love that when they show all this data here, by the way. I think I've mentioned that already. Um, so what we're looking at here is, uh, is the discharge of the major river systems. So Fort McMurray, of course, is right here again, right there at the nexus of the Clearwater and the Athabasca. And the Athabasca, you can see, is, is, a, is a pretty major river, lots of water uh, flowing down it. Um, Edmonton and Calgary, they're large cities, and of course, they're built on river systems because that uh, was important uh, historically and still today for, for, um, for building cities, right? They have to be on a source of, of water, of course. Um, up here is the Peace River, and the Peace River, you can see the amount of water discharge is just absolutely massive, but not so relevant to um, the Fort McMurray, of course, and um, much more relevant to the few people that live way up there. So by the way, some, some, um, some definitions I'm gonna come back to. Um, you can see that they're, they're measuring water here in, in different uh, units here. So DAM cube is a cubic decameter. It's not usually a term that's used that often unless you're talking about massive amounts of water. Uh, you're probably mostly familiar with using liters. So a liter is like a, um, a carton of milk. So if you think about carton of milk, the skinny ones are like this, right? All skinny carton of milk. Looks something like that. Sorry for my bad drawing. So that's a liter, right? And um, a thousand liters is a cubic meter and a million liters is a megaliter. So this is a megaliter. So we'll be talking more about metric computer conversions, but I thought it uh, doesn't hurt to throw them out now because you're gonna, we're gonna be doing a lot of metric conversions um, in this course. And uh, particularly when we start getting into the next unit where we're going to be dealing with a little bit of chemistry. So Alberta's groundwater, I think I mentioned this already in terms of this is, um, uh, about maybe 3% of Albertans are using groundwater on a regular basis. It's mostly rural Albertans and they're using wells and things like that. Um, and you can read about it. Like I said, there are, there's a bit more detail on that in, um, in that uh, document that, you're, that you need to read. Um, I guess another thing to say about groundwater, I know there's a few notes here, is that uh, a lot of it is not accessible <laughs> very easily anyway. Um, Alberta, you know, the studies show there's a lot of groundwater in Alberta. Uh, much of it is very deep. Uh, so I suppose you could access it by digging super deep wells. But for the most part, Albertans don't need to get at that groundwater. Um, we have all these rivers everywhere, and this is where most of our water is coming from. Um, and, uh, but maybe in the future, uh, this will be something farmers in particular might be looking at uh, in Southern Alberta. If, they, if the rivers are, you know, the amount of water in the rivers is slowing down. Um, in the north, well, we will talk of oil and gas a little bit. Like I said, uh, a big chunk of the water used up here is, is oil and gas operations. So much more on this later. So let's talk a little bit about watersheds and what is a watershed. I don't know. Do you guys talk about watersheds in, um, in EAS 100? Yes or no? Anybody, yes or no, when you talk about watersheds in Neil's class? Well, we'll talk a little bit about them here, what a watershed is. Um, so if you take a look at this, it's again, another map of Alberta, and it's talking about uh, the major watersheds. Another term for watershed is river basin. And uh, so if you take a look, here's, here's a definition. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Here's a definition of a watershed. and uh, it's kind of looking at the area of land that catches the water, right? And you can see this definition here, it's, it's done by, um, by looking at elevation and things like that. I'm just gonna play this uh, video for you. It's really short, it's about a minute long. It kind of defines what a watershed is. So I'm just gonna make sure I've got my sound going. Okay, so here it goes. What is a watershed? Is it a shed that holds water? Nah. Try again. A watershed is all of the land that drains into the same location or body of water. 
People tend to think only of water bodies, such as rivers, lakes and wetlands, as being part of their watershed. However, any land, whether it is park, farm, forest, school parking lot, and even the soil we build our homes on is also included. Think of a watershed as a funnel, collecting all the water within a specific area and draining into the nearest body of water. Drop by drop, water is channeled into soil, groundwater, creeks and streams, making its way to larger rivers and eventually the ocean. Everyone in the world lives in a watershed. Watersheds know no political borders, whether local, national or international. Our environment, our economy and our society all depend on a healthy watershed. So here's your watershed, right? And um, like I said, this is kind of a way to think about how all the water in an area, just basically due to elevation and gravity, is, is going to be affected. And so um, when we look at, uh, at, at the geography of places, uh, if you look at North America, there is a handful of watersheds in North America. So you can see that uh, that blue region, that is uh, all the water there ultimately eventually drains into the Arctic Ocean, whether it's through James Bay or Hudson's Bay or way up much further north. We have the Pacific watershed that is draining into the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic going to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, if you um, look at Canada, in general, uh, sometimes people break things down a bit more. You can see Hudson's Bay versus the Arctic Ocean are, are kind of separated into two watersheds and whatnot. And then, um, so um, if we look at Alberta here, and I'll zoom in on Alberta again in a minute, um, but the water in Alberta is really draining to all three of our oceans. Some of our water is draining north. So through Fort McMurray, it's going through Northwest Territories and ultimately draining out in the Arctic Ocean. Some of our water is draining east towards um, Hudson's Bay, uh, some of it draining towards the Mississippi River in the southern part of the province, and some of it draining towards the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. So uh, a lot going on there. Um, just wanna show you basically how these things are delineated, meaning how we figure out where they are, and you can do this on a small scale, larger scale. Uh, basically, they look at elevation maps, and uh, you can see what's done here is that all of the high points are basically marked. And then it's kind of like connecting the dots, right? And, uh, you know, so all that water in that area is going to funnel down into that river in the center and get drained wherever that river is going. So one more picture for you, kind of just showing the concept of, uh, of a watershed. So back to Alberta here. Um, often you'll hear the term uh, watershed management because, um, Basically, everybody, all the communities in a particular watershed are um, interacting with one another. So Fort McMurray is way over here, okay? So the question is, right, you know, who is uh, who's north of Fort McMurray along this river? So we've got Fort Mackay, Fort Chippewan. Uh, who is uh, upstream of, um, of Fort McMurray? Um, you've got the uh, uh, city of Jasper, Hinton, and a few other things like that. And so we're all interacting with one another. So if one of us is polluting the river or the watershed, it's going to affect other people in the watershed. And so this is something that is thought about a lot in, uh, with environmental agencies and governments and regulatory bodies in terms of um, you know, what is uh, uh, going on with the water usage and pollution and things like that. So we are, of course, in the Athabasca watershed or Athabasca River Basin. And uh, I'll just finish up here. In a moment, um, I thought I had a map here, but maybe I'll, I'll find that for next day. And because of course the Athabasca River is the major part of this. And I'll just say that the Athabasca River starts over here in the mountains and it starts in the Columbia ice fields. So maybe I'll just finish off and just show you this picture here. The Columbia ice fields are famous. Um, if you go to Jasper Banff, um, there's these glacier to, uh, tours and uh, you, can, you can learn all about them there. So what I'm going to do is finish there today and we'll come back and pick this up uh, next day and we'll talk a little bit more about our watershed, a little bit more about Alberta water resources and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the first test and we might start topic two, kind of depends on how far we get with everything.